it up pretty well. And now you're trying to listen to me. But you also have a voice in your head that says things. Haven't you noticed? And it, it, it says things. Uh, it, it says things that are completely unconstrained at times by the thing you're trying to focus on. I mean, I'm, I'm standing up here trying to reason with you, and you you will think he does look a little like Ben Stiller. <laughs> Thoughts just emerge in consciousness. We are not authoring them. That, that, that would require that we think them before we think them. If you, if you can't control your next thought, and you don't know what it's going to be until it arises, where's your freedom of will? Now, some people try to save free will by saying, well, you're, you're more than that. You're more than just your conscious mind. You are, you are the totality of events occurring in your body. So it doesn't matter that you're not conscious as much of your mental process. And it's your, your, the, un, the unconscious neurophysiology of your brain is just as much you as your conscious experience is. But the problem, however, is that this really is a bait and switch. You, you can't honestly take credit for your unconscious mental life. You, you have, you're making millions of decisions right now with organs other than your brain, which you're not conscious of. But you don't feel responsible for these decisions. Are you making red blood cells at this moment? That your body is, hopefully. But if it were to stop doing this, you would be the victim of that change. You wouldn't be the author. The, the truth is we feel or presume an authorship over our actions, over certain and thoughts, over a certain channel of information in our conscious mind that is illusory. So, so how can we be free as conscious agents if everything that we consciously intend is caused by things we did not intend and of which we are entirely unaware? We can't. I'm often misconstrued as advocating that we pass laws against religious belief, that somehow we, we create some mechanism whereby we really put the, turn down the screws on religious people. Uh, I'm not advocating that at all. I'm really advocating just new rules of conversation. Ask yourself, what do we do with the astrologers? You know, I mean, how, how have we managed to keep astrologers off the Supreme Court or off our medical boards? Or, but not out of the White House. Well, there's, there's always marriage, the peril of marriage, perhaps. Um, but by and large, astrologers are not acquiring vast responsibility in our society. We're not continually ambushed by the, the neurosurgeon who doesn't want to perform surgery that day because Saturn is in retrograde or whatever. I mean, this is not happening. Um, it's not happening because when someone talks with too much conviction about the effect of, of the planets on, on human affairs, uh, we begin to stop listening to them. We stop taking them seriously. They don't get promoted. No, there's no laws involved. And I just think that, that should happen when, when people begin uh, to express their certainty that Jesus is coming back in their lifetime, etc. We are misled, especially in the secular community, by the term religion. Religion is a word like sports. Sports that are incredibly dangerous, that are synonymous with violence, like Thai boxing, or mixed martial arts, or football. And there's sports that, that by definition, entail no danger whatsoever. Advocacy, lawn bowling. I mean, these, these, these two things at the continuum have almost nothing in common except for greed. And yet we, we have this one word, sports. Now, religion is a suitcase term. So Bob, I think, has, has, it's not by accident that he is that focused on Islam in, in his remarks. And it's not by accident that we have, uh, that I have tended to focus on Islam. We are we're not doing ourselves a service. 
and the normal religion of the same. Beliefs matter, specific beliefs matter. Bob is trying to uncouple religious beliefs from what people actually do in the world, like blow themselves up in crowds of strangers. But the people who have done this work, like, like Roger, Robert Pape or Scott Atran or any of the other uh, academics who are fundamentally skeptical of the link between Islam and suicide bombing are people who, when I talk to them, uh, really express an inability to digest the fact that people actually believe what they say they believe. There are people who are certain of paradise. There's a certainty about paradise. There's a certainty that the doctrine of martyrdom is true. Is what's so terrifying about it. Now, I ask you, where, where are all of the Palestinian Christian suicide bombers? I think there, I think there probably has been one. By and large, I mean, there are Palestinian Christians. They are Palestinian. They live in occupied territory. They are not reliably blowing themselves up. He's a religion of everywhere. It does immense unnecessary harm at its worst, and at its best, it gives people bad reasons to be good, where good reasons are actually available. So this is the problem, is whenever you can see someone doing really good things in the name of faith, you can find better reasons to do those things. And that's, that's so I mean, when people go to Africa, I mean, there's, there's no question that people of faith do uh, immensely compassionate things. So some people will go to you know, missionaries will go to Africa and put themselves in harm's way and try to try to um, deliver aid to to people on the verge of famine and it's, it's an intrinsically good thing to do but rather often you see the, the, the compassion of the whole enterprise eroded by this other agenda which is to spread the gospel in this case. So you have people preaching the importance of believing in Jesus in areas where conflict between Christians and Muslims has literally killed millions of people. Uh, and in the most diabolical instances, withholding aid from people who are still there somehow confess an allegiance to, to the creed you're, you're spreading.